Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our August the 4th Council meeting. It is with heavy heart we meet tonight after the passing of Ward 2 Councillor Gary Baines. Gary loved the town of Bradford, West Gwilmbury. He was born and raised here, and he loved being a councillor of the town of Bradford, West Gwilmbury, and he worked hard for all the residents of our community. He made a difference in our town. He will have left a lasting legacy. And the notes and comments on social media and emails to the family show how well he was respected, how well he was thought of in our town. Whether it was with active transportation or walk and wheel Wednesday or housing, different types of housing for for all types of residents, whether it was with sporting events and sports teams, Gary was involved and he loved being a counselor in the town of Bradford, West Gwilmbury. So as we do at the start of every council meeting, we do have a short moment of private contemplation. So at tonight's meeting, Please take a moment to think of Councillor Gary Baines, the legacy he lost. He left us, he left us too soon, but wish his family condolences and thank his family for sharing Gary Baines with the town of Brad. Please join me in a moment of private contemplation. Thank you, everybody, that uh, this will be a, a tough meeting to get through because uh, different uh, agenda items. I know uh, all members of council will be thinking about what Gary would have brought to the table, and he's not with us tonight, but he will be missed, but we'll carry on. So I will re re reconvene this regular meeting of council at 7.04 p.m. We did have a closed session meeting earlier at five o'clock and there are no motions arising out of the closed session. So we'll move on to ad adoption of agenda. So the recommendation is that the regular council agenda dated August the 4th, 2020 be adopted as printed. May I have a mover and a seconder for this? Councillor Sandu, Councillor Lamb. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, it is carried. At this time, Council, you may declare any pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. Seeing none. We'll move on and uh, there are no presentations or no deputations. And uh, our, I'll ask our clerk, Rebecca Murphy, is there anybody that has signed up for open forum tonight? Uh, no, Your Worship, there's no one who's registered to speak tonight. Okay, so we'll move on to item 10, adoption of council minutes. So the recommendation is that the minutes of the special council public planning meeting, meeting dated June the 9th, 2020, and the regular council meeting dated June the 16th, 2020, be adopted as printed. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Orr, Councillor Contois. Any errors or omissions?
Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And it is carried. Next up, item 11, correspondence for information. So the recommendation is that the correspondence for information items dated August the 4th, 2020 be received. A mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Lamb, Councillor Dykey, comments or questions? Seeing no comments, we'll just uh, receive the correspondence as, uh, as read. So I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor of receiving, it is carried. So we move on to item, uh, item 12, staff reports. And 12.1, uh, report of community services. And it's BWG Leisure Center reopening strategy. So the recommendation is that report COM 2020-19 entitled BWG Leisure Center reopening strategy be received and that council approve a staggered reopening strategy that would involve the restarting of modified services one program area at a time subject to further information. So may I have a mover and a seconder to get this on the floor. Councillor Contois, Deputy Mayor LeDuc. So comments or questions? This is uh, quite an extensive report. We can tell that uh, our Director of Leisure Services, uh, Community Services, Terry Foran, put an awful lot of work into this. And there's an awful lot involved in uh, reopening the Leisure Center with COVID-19 and uh, regulations that are in place that the province and uh, the health unit have put in place. So questions or comments? Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Uh, thank you, Worship, through you. Uh, not really any questions, just uh, just wanted to thank Terry for this uh, um, great report. It's a lot of, like you said earlier, there's a lot of effort went into it. I like the decision-making flow chart. Um, I can see that it's, um, it's going to be a, a very tough uh, position for our community to, uh, to restart some of these areas where there's a huge uh, cost to us. And, and the cost has been from uh, basically uh, uh, implemented through the, the fact that we have to work in a safe environment and create the, a safe environment for our residents. So I'm really hoping that uh, with some of the funding that the federal government has, uh, has introduced um, would hopefully trickle down to us to help us with some of these cover recovery costs. I mean, we usually run our uh, from the report, you can see we usually run our recovery at around a 70% uh, range uh, when it comes to those uh, services that we provide. But uh, we're looking at some quite, quite uh, drastic uh, um, costs for, for lack of recovery because of the because of the safety measures in, uh, in place. And I really want to thank Terry uh, for doing that and putting that report together and making sure that not only residents, but our staff and everybody is uh, hopefully going to be safe and, and able to restart some of these programs. So Terry, I, I don't know, you know, the, the report is very, uh, it's, it's like a live document. It seems to change and, and it will change probably day by day as, as you hear from the health department. But uh, I'm just wondering, Terry, have you heard any news since you wrote this report about any potential <laughs> funding coming forward from um, any levels of government to help us with this restart when it comes to uh, opening up these, uh, these services to our community. So is there any, do you know of any, any funding that could come from upper levels of government to start? Through your worship to uh, Deputy Mayor LeDuc, um, thank you for the question. At this time, um, there's no new information that we don't, that we don't know um, that, that I can offer. We know that there's talk of federal funding coming um, what, or provincial funding, potentially federal. Um, where that money and how that money will be spent is still to be is still to be determined. Um, so I, I wish I could answer further, but there, there's really nothing more I can offer you than what you already know. So Terry, further in this report, that so we're looking at uh, three areas. Are you are you looking at opening all three areas at the same time, or are we looking at uh, the ice surface being the first open area and then moving into the aquatics, and then uh, and then the gymnasium area? So what's your I, I know I think it says in the report. I apologize. I read it earlier and I. Just not sure what uh, what what phase we're moving into first. If it's if there's going to be a stag a stagger opening, because I know we um, talked about the province has talked about where we only have uh, 50 people. I know when it comes to facilities, there was some 
indication in this report where you haven't got all of the uh, data, but I'm just wondering, um, do you have any further data out of this report when it comes to uh, potentially offering more people inside the building? Certainly. Um, the basis of the report really has not changed from when we started months ago in trying to understand the direction we we're going to be going based on the provincial direction that's been offered to us. Um, so really that, that consideration has been primarily maintaining um, spatial separation as our primary goal. The new numbers of offering 50 into a facility only um, still need to be understood. Uh, we did receive some comment back today from the province. We did apply um, about a week and a half ago to the province to try and increase that number by breaking our facility into two pieces, warm side, cold side. So arenas, fitness pool, uh, gymnasium. Um, again, we haven't been really offered any further clarity than what we already know. Um, I'll be working in, with, with Rebecca directly. She's um, part of a working group with other municipal lawyers uh, trying to solve what this, what this 50 person rule really means. Because again, um, we're not really receiving the actual answers we want from the province. And certainly the, uh, the district health unit is, is erring on the side of caution, referring us to the province. So we're in a bit of a stalemate right now, but we're gonna navigate through it. This is not unique to us. It's unique to every, every municipality and every municipality has a different spin or a different um, take working with their, with their lawyers to try and solve that, that exact 50 person rule problem that we're working with. Uh, ideally, if we could um, get the facility broken into two pieces, it would be the best case scenario where we can put the most amount of people into the facility at one time. Um, within the report, there's a lot of different uh, scenarios going, but to answer your most specific question, what area would we start first? Um, it would make best sense with good cost recovery. Uh, it's not great cost recovery from where we were. It would only, rec would only really reflect about 40% of that area's cost recovery uh, being the arenas first. Um, the reason it's, we're calculating at 40% recovery would be, yes, we want to see both arenas at the Leisure Centre operating. They'd be staggered start times on the half hour, no different than before but we would be required to have some time separation of an hour in between each one of these rentals to move people in and out so that we don't cross that 50 person rule as we know it today. Um, so that this is the model we're working on. Should we get more information on that and where numbers come up or we're able to do 50 on the warm side as we're planning, we're gonna start working towards our model of spatial separation and the numbers that we think that we can actually facilitate in the building anyway. Um, so we are going down that road right now, um, but we will have to have greater understanding of it. So my best recommendation to start operation would be the arenas first, uh, should council choose to do that. Then the next easiest as a phase, as we learn how the building flow works, uh, we could move then into potentially fitness, um, offering some fitness classes, some programs based on what we know we can do up in the center. As you see in, within the report, it's a very complex problem in how we're even operate fitness. It would be individuals by, by appointments. Um, this is very similar strategy that other towns are talking about doing as well. Uh, I know Aurora has started that with one of their aquatics facilities currently, and it's by appointment only to a limited capacity that they can offer in any specific area. So in those two areas would represent possibly the best cost recovery. So that impact wouldn't be as dramatic as say, trying to open the aquatic center fitness, everything all at once today. But I think as we go along and whatever direction we want to go in, um, I think that we will progress a little bit better providing that we get clear information or maybe a few or, or possibly more restrictions lifted or greater numbers offered to us that we can offer then to our public. So I'm not I'm kind of all over the place with that one, but I, I hope I got where you were uh, trying no, to be. You did, Terry. Thank you very much. You did a great job. And I, I again, I want to thank you very much for, for uh, doing this large report. I know in your report, you also said that you were going to potentially, I think, I think if I can recall, you said you're going to reach out to the area, the group area to find the areas to reach out if they're to see their confidence level in, in uh, the program, stuff like that. So I don't know if you have yet, uh, if, if you, uh, if you have or have not, that's fine. I'm, I'll leave the questioning for others, but uh, just if you can comment on that when you get another question later on uh, from somebody else, just if you have reached out to the groups. Um, certainly, I can I can kind of answer that now. We have been speaking with a couple of our primary organizations. Um, we're really holding off until we see where we end up today. The latest information I know is, you know, minor hockey um, may be ready to get rolling late September. Uh, our figure skating group would like to be in the door um, as, as fast as we possibly can roll. Um, and certainly, um, I believe that our local junior um, is trying to have a start up as well. I haven't reached out directly to them most recently. Um, but I know that a number of clubs are trying to uh, work their own return policies to play. Um, 
that will be provided to us that will hopefully and we'll work together with them to, to develop that based under our criteria that we've, that we've established. Um, but further to that, we did put out surveys to the public um, just for a two week period from July 16th to the 30th. Uh, we had 1,364 um, respondents to the general public on what they're looking for, what their comfort level would be coming back. So I think we had a, we had a nice response to that with the number of respondents. Um, and it varies in, in opinion. Um, I think there's about 55% that are very excited uh, or are very are happy to get back in. And certainly um, there is that, that, that portion of the population around 30, 35%, um, they're quite nervous still. And of course, and for, and for reasonable cause um, with their primary concern being what's the climate is gonna be like, how efficient, are we gonna be eliminating our numbers to appropriate levels, space separation, all, all the things that we've been talking about for months. So um, I think we've done the best we can at this point in talking to a lot of our users um, with the sport fields, we've been working with them. I was in conversations again today with North Minor Ball, but really this report is strictly about getting our indoor facilities open, not so much what we've been doing with the outside. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Councillor Sandy. Thank you, Worship. I don't have a question, just a comment. Thank you, Terry, for your report. I see lots of work went into this and, and even a lot more work is gonna go into opening back the facilities. Um, I see that, you know, you estimated cost recovery at 21%. That's just an estimate compared to 2019, which is 70.3. I just want everyone to understand safety of our residents and, and their children outweighs everything. And, and that's why I, I, I don't have a problem supporting this gradual opening. Um, there is um, lots of talk, lots of pressure from various groups to open it, but we have to check, look at the safety first. So I, I will be supporting this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sandu. Other uh, comments or questions that... Uh... It is uh, very restrictive that the, with the uh, limit at 50 people in, in such a large building. So hopefully that that, uh, if we can uh, split the building in two so that we are able to have the warm side and the cold side, that that will uh, help the financial picture out a little bit and we would be able to uh, see a little bit more revenue coming in and uh, as the deputy mayor had said that uh, the federal government made a, a big announcement uh, along with the provincial government of money coming to municipalities because of the hardships of COVID-19 and no doubt leisure facilities uh, uh, which uh, municipalities are, are responsible for are taking a big hit because of the costs involved because of the uh, restrictions and uh, the uh, physical distancing that is needed so that uh, hopefully there will be funding that uh, will come to the town of Bradford West Goulombury and we'll be able to put uh, some of that to, uh, to help with the uh, Leisure Centre finances to be able to open up and to... Our residents, I think, uh, want something to do or, you know, it, it, this has been going on a long time and uh, to be able to have the facilities there that uh, to be able to um, allow some hockey, figure skating, basketball, fitness, aquatics, um, that would be nice. But uh, as Councillor Sandu has said, that uh, we have to do it safely and we have to do it within the regulations that are put out there for us so that... Uh, the recommendation as it <clears throat> states is to uh, have a staggered reopening strategy. And I think that's, uh, we can support that. And uh, as more information comes forward and uh, that uh, I, I guess, <clears throat> are, are we looking at September, Terry? Would, would, would we be able to, the, the first of se September, would that be a possibility for, for part of the, the first stage, or is it still too early to uh, to comment on, on what time frame we're looking at? Um, thank you for the question, Your Worship. Um, 
the timing um, is crucial to other operations that we have going on currently. Um, the arenas uh, at the Leisure Center are ready. Um, we, we kept our ice at a low level uh, through it. So we are ready to mobilize. The unfortunate part is um, we are gonna have to, we, we have um, redeployed our staff from facilities into parks um, because of our uh, no hiring of our, our, of our typical summer crew. So I would want to get through, and we, we still need some time to just work, navigate through some of the intricacies of how we're gonna be bringing people back in. Although we, I think we have a solid plan on the ground within the, in the facility as of today, there's still a bit of work to do. Um, I would be optimistic that we could shoot for potentially in around September 8th um, to start introducing uh, ice time back in. We have a lot of work to do um, between now and then working with our user groups with uh, certainly minor hockey, figure skating, um, some minor regional groups and, um, and, and our local juniors. And we wanna get that coordinated through a bit of an ice allocation. We already have a template of a schedule that we know we can work with that offers kind of uh, comparable, comparable time that would be available in previous years, but at that reduced level. So we, we do have a lot of, um, we do have a, a number of items to work through, but I think, it, um, and even work, working within the 50 person rule, uh, we could probably get the arenas going. 25 people per rink at a time, moving in and out um, at, at the typical rates that, we're, that we have always um, requested. So that, that would be my best, um, my best prediction at this time would be in around the September 8th to no later than maybe mid-September. Okay, thank you, Terry. Uh, Councillor Dakey. <clears throat> You know, once again, Terry, uh, to your team as well as yourself, a very well written report. And, uh, I, you know, as safety will definitely be one, uh, number one, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a debate how the school board is going to be dealing with the schools. Um, you know, that's going to be quite a quite a topic in weeks to, weeks to come, uh, how that unfolds. But but I like your idea of the 50, um, you know, and stagger it. You know, it, we need to slowly... You know, slowly, um, you know, open open these buildings up. Uh, I know everybody's anxious. People now are getting out. You see the roads busier. But uh, you know, on, on saying that, it's amazing how many people still walk around and don't don't want to wear a mask. So I would hope that uh, you know the people continue to be safe and wear the mask, and especially entering all, all the buildings. But I see it on a day to day uh, day to day basis that. You know, some people wear the mask, uh, some don't want to. So, so you know, it's, we have to continue to be very cautious as everything fo uh, unfolds in, in the fall. The weather changing, and, and I hope that uh, we don't get another big phase of this because I, I would never believe that w w we are sitting today and we're, and we're still have to deal with it. I would, I would have really hoped that this would have been gone by June, but I think we're in it for uh, years to come yet. Huh? But uh, shocking. Councillor Cantoin, do you want to uh, say something? Councillor Cantoin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Your Worship. And Terry, uh, yeah, great report, uh, good detail. Um, I just want to know, um, you know, how's this going? To, are we going to be able to maybe launch Bob Ballas? And I'm not sure about how the soccer dome is going to work because it's private, but things of, of, of that type, I, I was just curious. I didn't see it in there. Unless I missed it, I don't think so. But I'll let you comment on that. Sure. Through your worship to Councillor Contois. Um, and just on the sports dome, I have had conversation with the proprietors on what their strategy is. Um, very similar to us. They're looking for some guidance from the province at this point on what they can do to open their facility to make it viable. Uh, no different than we are. Um, so really, I can't really comment on that business outside of what I know uh, today. Um, okay. When it comes to the Bob Fallis, I did make mention that um, the cost recovery out of the gate with the Bob Fallis uh, would be very similar in nature in around the 40%. Um, I think that we could get to a better uh, cost recovery over time on that facility because it is a standalone. And we may be able to condense those times from maybe an hour in between down to half an hour in between, which can help the bottom end a little bit. The cost recovery of that facility has always been solid uh, in reality, um, but it's still gonna be, it's still, it still will be a financial hit to get it going. Um, but yes, we could get it going. Um, I think the first steps will be to reach out to our user groups. Um, within the report, I did mention the priority would be minor, minor local, um, regional minor, 
and local junior. We still have a lot, a lot of private renters out there as well. Like we are, we, we have our traditional uh, men's women's um, groups that use our facility later in the evening. Um, we would then have to think about how our, how, how our flow is working and then integrate those users back in at some point as well. Um, and the Valpolis could easily assist us with all of that. But I think once we get some, some information back from our minor locals first on what their thoughts are and the number of hours they may be requesting, uh, we're gonna then see where we can add more. And just like I said, learn as we go and try and condense as we go uh, to, you know, and, and certainly being erring on, erring on the side of caution every step of the way. Obviously we're watching what our neighbors are doing everywhere. Uh, we're in working groups with many municipalities, uh, all trying to talk and work through this together. We all have unique challenges with different facility configurations. Um, but yes, um, there would be an upstart, of course, to the Bob Fallis. Uh, ice installation overall with wage and material could be in around $10,000 to get it in. That's what we would do normally put in the ice in anyway. Um, but certainly I can provide more information as that information comes available to me on what it looks like and when maybe we can install. Thank you, Terry. And uh, any other comments or questions? But uh, I think the way the recommendation is that we can uh, support that a uh, staggered reopening strategy that would involve restarting a modified services one program area at a time, subject to further information. And uh, with that, not seeing any, any other comments. I'll call for the vote then. All those in favor of the recommendation. Opposed? It is carried. So thank you, Terry and your staff that uh, still a lot of work to do and to uh, just be um, cognizant of the, you know, the provincial announcements and uh, what our neighbors are doing and uh, but uh, Hopefully, in yeah, September the 8th, that uh, part of the Leisure Centre uh, will be open for, for one, uh, one activity or another. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next uh, staff report, and it's Report of Community Services, Fall Winter Events Dec Decisions Timeframe. So the recommendation is that report COM 2020-20, entitled Fall Winter Events Decision Timeframe, be received and the staff be authorized to make a decision about the delivery of events, modification and or cancellation if necessary for all fall winter seasonal municipal events as required per the schedule in the report. So a mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Sandu, Councillor Contois, comments or questions? Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Yes, thank you, Worship. Through you, Terry. Another uh, another good report. But I'm I'm just curious, Terry. Uh, you know, I know I know we've been we've been we're doing a great job canceling things. But I just wanted to like let me, let me just speak about the two runs first, and the Terry Fox run and the uh, and the run for Bradford West Glenbury. Is there any? Have you talked to those groups? Of are they interested in putting those runs on still, uh, or or are we just making this decision on August seventh uh, to close, to shut them down anyways? Because we are able to do hundred people outside now. And when I look at these two runs, I'm just wondering if, uh, if we could accommodate that. So I'm just, I'm just curious about just those two runs to start with. The other events, Terry, um, Pumpkin Fest. And I, I mean, we just started that and it's such a great event, October 17th. So I'm, I'm wondering some of these dates, Terry, I, I, I was hoping that maybe we could, we could just push these dates along. Like, really, what's, what's the, what, for some of these things, what's the commitment if we went out and we said, you know what, let me let Santa Claus parade just for curiosity. Santa Claus parade, we go out and we, we put the applications out there. We tell everybody, hey, if we're able to do the Santa Claus parade, here's your application. Fill it in. If you want to be the Santa Claus parade, uh, you know, please come back with uh, sponsors and things like that. I'm just thinking, like, we could reach out to people. We could make these requests to say, this is our event, but we, you know, because of COVID, we're not sure. Nobody's sure. I think everybody's in the same boat we are. Is there no way we could still try and move these events to say that within the last week or so we could cancel it? Because when I really look at, say, uh, Hockey Day, I mean, we usually look at Hockey Day and it's almost the last week when we know if we're going to be able to do that or not, because sometimes we go from skates to, to boots. So I'm just, I'm just curious, is, can we not just try and make these events for now? Because, because everybody's been going through COVID for so long, and some of these events are more outdoorish events, and I'm just thinking that, you know, if there's an opportunity for us to maybe 
stretch these dates a little bit and say, let's work with the groups that we work with normally as our sponsors or the, the event people that we were them to say, listen, let's take it down to the last minute. And if we can't do it the last minute, no harm, no foul. So no, no, you know, when it comes to sponsorship, no money exchange until we, we actually get to the point where we're saying a week, maybe two weeks prior, we're able to go, we're going to do our printing, we're going to do our advertising. It'll be most advertising now is going to be mostly uh, social media anyway. So I'm just curious, Terry, if there's some way we can just try these to change, to be a little bit more flexible, to ha to talk to the people out there that support these events to see if they're willing to uh, be as flexible as we are, because uh, some of these events are, are um, in my mind, uh, you know, great events to have. And, and, and they, they really bring a, a mental health aspect to them in a sense for people to be outside enjoying some of these, uh, some of these great opportunities. So just curious, Terry, if these are really need to be hardcore, if we can actually just flex them a little bit for the fall. So that's my only question really. Certainly through your worship to uh, Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Um, no, good question and very fair question. Um, I've been actually discussed, I've, I've been having conversations with both uh, Nick and Bethany on this very topic. Um, and yes, like we are considering, if we look at Pumpkin, Fe Pumpkin Fest from last year, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of people attend. Um, and certainly we know that we can have a hundred people at an outdoor event. Um, and that is in the back of our minds. Uh, these dates are the original dates that were presented uh, geez, a few months ago, um, just for, for just for council's consideration at the time. Um, so yes, are we thinking about doing something smaller that we can then do, you know, even, even trying to solve on who gets to come? It was going to be a bit of an issue, but we're trying to figure that out. So if we can, we would like to, and we're going to still think about that, definitely for, um, for Pumpkin Fest. Um, so is this date hard and firm? No, not necessarily. Is it hard and firm that we're going to be at the same scale that we were last year? Absolutely not, just with what we know um, for outdoor events. So we are working on something for that for consideration. Um, when it comes to the Santa Claus Parade, a bit of a different beast altogether. Again, there's, there's, the streets are lined shoulder to shoulder. It's a very popular event. Um, we've all seen it. Um, with the dates for um, Santa Claus Parade, it's very tricky. Yes, um, your questions are who's going who's to be interested, who's going to want to participate. We'll be getting through that hurdle. Uh, we know that. Um, if we were to secure bands or entertainment that we normally would, this would be um, a very typical drop dead date to try and secure. Otherwise, we're going to lose what might be available out there as far as priority. Um, you know, other towns are trying to solve this one as well. Nobody has an answer yet today, um, but we're working on it. So. Can we think about it longer? Yes. Um, will it be much more reduced the longer we go out and what the scale could be? Yes, for sure. Um, but we know that and, and, and that is under consideration. I can't give you any, any dates on how far we can draw it out, only that at some point we will have to pull the plug and we'll have to uh, inform, inform council of that. So yes, they're under consideration. Um, as far as the run for BWG and Terry Fox run, I'm thinking I'm gonna pass you over to Bethany. I know Bethany Kudumiwa is with us. Uh, and she can maybe answer that more directly because these are um, the closest ones coming uh, right now. So maybe we pass it to Bethany. Um, through your worship to the deputy mayor. Um, so with the, both the Terry Fox run and the run for BWG, both of them typically have an attendance of more than a hundred. Um, my plan is this week after this report is received by council is to reach out to both event organizers to gauge their interest in proceeding with the event. I haven't heard anything from them yet to date. Um, so if they are interested in proceeding with the event, that's when we would look at to see what is feasible um, within the restrictions that we have from the province. Are they able to restrict the attendance to keep it at a capacity of 100? Are they able to put in measures in place to allow for social distancing what activities do they have planned? Are there any concerns? And we would ensure that they have um, a solid plan in terms of health and safety before we would consider proceeding with allowing them to do the event. Um, with the way they've done the event in the past, as per normal, that's not feasible given the current restrictions we have at the time. Um, but with some planning and some cooperation, I think it's definitely feasible. It's just going to depend on their resources. You know, both organizations are heavily volunteer driven, so they may not have the capacity to do it or they might not be wa wanting to. Um, so I was waiting for this report to be received by council before I reached out to them to see what their intentions are for this year. 
just to ca a comment further then on, on the two runs, and I'll, I'll, I'll let others jump in in a minute. I got some more comments I want to make about the other events, sound growth brain, things like that. But for the runs, uh, Bethany and Terry, either one is, would we have the resources to help the volunteers uh, um, with this run? Would we have some spare of uh, our, our own employees to maybe uh, uh, for those weekend events? So could we could we offer up some assistance to them if that's uh, if they're if they're willing to look at it? Just question either one. I don't know if that's able for us to do or not. It's really going to depend on the resources that they're looking for, um, and it's really going to come down to the plan. Ultimately, it's their event, but it's on our property, so we have to ensure that they're meeting um, all the specific health regulations. And so it's just going to depend on the nature of the event that they're wishing to have and whether that's um, realistic given, given the capacities that we have. And it is um, really a moving target, but right now I think kind of where we're at in the time frame of things, um, September is really close and I would imagine still in September we would probably be close to having still an outdoor event with a capacity of over a hundred so it's just going to matter whether they have the resources for planning. Okay, Councillor Sandu. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, adding to Deputy Mayor's comments, the, the two runs um, I'm hoping, Bethany or, or Terry, that we had a dialogue with them beforehand. Uh, you know, we're not doing this, like there's nothing in this report that, that says that we had to wait for that dialogue to happen. That, that dialogue should have happened before. And I don't know if, if you guys know or, or feel that something, something's coming down the pipeline in the next three days that would change the decision. Um, because seventh is just end of this week, right? Um, my biggest thing is the Remembrance Day Parade. The turnout for the Remembrance Day Parade is not like the Santa Claus Parade. Um, and we can keep that separate. That is one thing that I would definitely want to see that, that somehow we also stick to the timeline on that one and, and uh, you know, by keeping the guidelines um, the other dates, I, I, I agree with the deputy mayor. Some of these dates, we don't really need to make decisions this, the, you know, on September 21st or st September 25th, we have time. We can make the decision. You can still plan it, but the cutoff date shouldn't be that. Just, just my comment. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sandu. Other comments or questions? Councillor Ferragini. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, it's, it's really sad to see us constantly cancel events and, and to the comments made previous about residents wanting to get out. Um, we all know that we're dealing with that and uh, with, with COVID, everything is just turned right upside down. Um, do we know though of any other municipality or any other area that has hosted anything as of late or they have anything coming up like a run um again it just really sucks that we're constantly canceling all these events but we have to be safe we have to be smart about it and just wondering if anybody else has taken that lead yet through your, um, sorry, through your worship to uh councillor Fergie. i will pass this over to bethany because i know she's in direct contact all the time um, again, she's a part of the working group of municipalities uh, for events as well. Um, there is, I know Aurora has just finally offered um, a movie in the park or a drive-in, very similar to what we're proposing to do in September. Um, but with the working groups that Bethany is aware of, that they are trying to solve the same problems. I can't speak about runs and community um, sponsored or supported events uh, specifically. Maybe Bethany can weigh in a little bit on it. Um, but certainly with the, with um, Santa Claus Parade or any parade, that is one of the conversations that is active right now. Try and, and for those folks to try and understand what they can do to bring people out to a parade uh, and do it safely. So Bethany, I know you can offer more. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Ferragini, um, I'm not aware of any municipalities that have any current runs happening right now. A lot of municipalities are in the same boat as ours, deciding just with the stage three guidelines being released recently, how they can work with event organizers 
um, to see what happens. A lot of cancellations have been blanketed across to anywhere from beginning of September to end of September. Um, to clarify, the time frame given in this report is not based on cancellation. Um, it's based on making a decision on how we can proceed with the event. Um, we had to unfortunately cancel a lot of events this spring and summer, which was extremely disappointing. And we recognize um, the need for events within the community. Um, so really the goal is moving forward, um, looking to see how we can modify the events to still offer something. And that's really why we have this time frame um, schedule. So knowing that, you know, by the beginning of September, um, by the you know, middle to beginning of August, um, having a pretty good idea of whether the run for BWG wants to um, continue with the run because we would need to have the parade permits um, submitted to South Simco Police to ensure that they have pay duty officers. So there's a lot of um, little details where we need to have those sorted out in advance. Um, it doesn't mean that everything has to be 100% um, all at once by that specific date, but we have to have a pretty good idea of how we're going to proceed. Um, an example would be like with the August 21st timeframe for Pumpkin Fest, like Terry mentioned, we're looking at other ways of how we can modify that event to meet any of the restrictions and guidelines we have at that given time. But by middle of August, we need to start booking things and planning and putting practices in place to ensure that we can have um, a successful event and a safe event. So I, I really want to be clear that it's not based on us wanting to cancel and making a decision to cancel two months before an event because we've just given up and said it's not possible. It's really just looking at how much time do we have to plan, what's realistic given the guidelines, and um, wanting to ensure that we have success. Some things may not be able to happen, um, but we have a lot of upcoming dates over the next couple of months, and there's a lot of moving dates, so I just wanted to be able um, to present these this information in this time frame to council so that they're aware when they see um, different promotion for events and to see how things have changed, they have an understanding uh, given this time frame. Okay, thank you, Bethany. Um, I wonder for the, the run for BWG and the Terry Fox run, would it be fair that the town would say that, yes, you can go ahead if you can limit the numbers to 100? And then it's up to the, the organizers to decide and come with a plan that, uh, you know, I think we'd still like them and uh, with, with the uh, provincial regulations that, uh, so it'd be a matter of you getting in touch with the uh, organizers and just see whether they were still, still uh, willing to proceed. And uh, yes, it probably will take more volunteer work on their behalf, but, uh, I would think that when they are outside events and uh, we, for a walk like that, the people don't have to be bunched up, they can uh, keep social distance, that it would be possible to, to move forward with them. But I have other councillors with their hands up. So Councillor Contois. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Bethany, I guess I'll, I'll ask you this question. Um, I'm looking at Pumpkin Fest. Now, Henderson's field is, is quite significant. Is it, is it not possible to segregate and make these areas into like pods where once you've entered it, you can't go into the other section? And maybe that way we can keep separation and, and more people. Um, and that's just one thought. And the other thought was uh, utilizing the CC field as well and maybe have uh, multiple little, uh, little punk and vests going on instead of one grandioso. I don't know if uh, any thought has gone into that or, or maybe you have, I don't know. But anyways, I'll let you comment on that. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Contois, um, with Henderson Park, it is a great um, this event venue given that it's gated and it allows us the ability to um, track the attendance. And so um, I do really want to proceed with something on that weekend. Pumpkin Fest is one of my personal favorite events and it's been incredibly successful over the past couple of years. Um, unfortunately, given the restrictions at the time, it is a capacity of 100 for an event. So even though Henderson Park is a massive um, 
a massive space and there's lots of space for social distancing, if at that given time, the restriction on the numbers for outdoor events is 100, we would have to keep it at 100. Um, fingers crossed that it does increase by October, but we're um, at the hands of the provincial government for that. Um, so if it, it has a capacity of 100, then we will put on something and have the capacity of 100 and have an event where people pre-register and create activities, entertainment based on what we can do safely and keeping the health of all the participants in mind. Just to follow up, Rob. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, but is it feasible or possible to utilize another field and have a similar event? So if we could have one going at Henderson, one at CC and have a hundred people at both. I'm just trying to get more kids out as possible and punk and fest is for kids. So I just a thought. For sure, um, I think we can definitely consider that. That's not something I've thought of right now. Um, Pumpkin Fest is a longer event, and so I'd probably look at how we programmed throughout the day and how we can allow people to come and go. So say if it's four or six hours, if people register for a time slot, so maybe people come and go on a certain schedule, then um, we can allow for more than 100. And again, hopefully, the numbers can go up. There's lots of things for us to consider and that's a great idea, which is kind of why, you know, in a couple of weeks, we really have to have a plan on how we want to move forward on that in order to provide something for the community. Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and thank you, Council Contour, because that's what I was hoping we would hear, something a little bit where we went, when we went for invitation only, staggered times, so that's kind of what I was hoping that we would look at these events and, and create those. Uh, I mean, you got social media, so it could be the first hundred at a certain time slot, second hundred, you know, time slots, everything through time slots. I would love us to take the lead on a lot of these, even the, even the uh, BWG run, the Terry Fox run. I would love us because we already have the safety plan. I think we already have that. I think if these two private organizations want to do their event and they can supply the volunteers, I think the safety plan, we could probably already have a pretty good idea of how to implement it. I think invitation only for the, they could even certainly do an invitation only and, and 100 people in the first section and they could have a, a again, two, two time slots for a run. I, I, I don't recall seeing much more than 100 if, if that. So uh, I'm thinking that they could probably pull this event off in a one hour, you know, a 10 o'clock start, and 11.30 start, something like that. Uh, I'm sure that there's something, I would just love us to think outside the box. Really, I'm, I'm just asking Bethany to really, really try and open your thoughts up and, and, uh, and create these events. Uh, um, with some with safety in mind, uh, always safety in mind, but uh, I think there's are ways of doing it and it's being creative and looking at uh, time slots, invitation only systems that work for these events. So I'm, I will leave the report. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with the, the, the hard deadlines. I would hope that we will uh, be a little more flexible. I think Terry had said that. So I will leave that up to staff to figure out how we're gonna pull these events off. Councilor Orr. Get my uh, mute off. Um, and there's no reason why uh, the runs can't be staggered too. I mean, for a change, right? It, it's, they can, uh, they could have two or three, over two or three hours if they wanted to, to get, they had more numbers, they could run maybe two runs and uh, get their numbers in that way. So I'm glad to hear that we're looking at all different options. Yes, and it'll be up to, you know, as the report says, staff to uh, be aware of uh, what the provincial regu regulations and if they can, uh, um, you know, have two separate runs, stagger the times so that uh, certain people leave and then others can come and whether that's allowed. So any other comments or questions? Otherwise, I'll call for the vote to uh, accept the recommendation. So all those in favor? Raise your hand. Opposed? It is carried. So the next report, 12.3 Building Permit Activity Report, January 1st, 2020 to June the 30th, 2020. So the recommendation is that report DES 2020-40 entitled Building Permit Activity Report, January the 1st, 2020 to June the 30th, 2020 be received for information. Mover and a seconder for this. 
Councillor Lamb, Councillor Dakey, comments or questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor LaDuke. You were more just a comment and it's, it, it was nice to see some of the numbers increase and that's a, uh, that's a good thing. I, 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 the one was the uh, residential occupancy. I like to see that number up. It's a 278. Our, our target is 325 a year. So uh, good to see that number up right now. And hopefully we'll continue on our target uh, that Mr. Uh, Peter Lux has laid out for us for other uh, future development, but good to see the numbers up. And, uh, and uh, it was obviously the changes we made to the building permit fee structure is actually uh, helping pay off and, and uh, make dividends for us. So good, good report. Enjoyed seeing, enjoyed seeing the numbers up. That was the real critical uh, thing for me. Thank you. Yes, and it is uh, a positive report and uh, that uh, I, yeah, 192 new home constructions that uh, it's good to see that, uh, and I noticed 23 farm buildings. So that uh, the number of farm uh, new buildings has uh, increased substantially. And uh, <laughs> I did actually send an email to our chief building official, just wondering whether uh, cannabis operations were uh, responsible for that. And he replied, no, since the 1st of April, they have to put on their building permit if that's what they're wanting. And none of the ones uh, replied that it was for cannabis. So these are uh, uh, farm operations that are, are uh, expanding and putting up buildings and uh, adding economic activity to our municipality. So that's, uh, that's good. Any other comments or questions? I'll call for the vote then, all in favor? It is carried. Next, 12.4, Report of Development and Engineering Services, Westbrook at Grand Central Phase 5, Pre-Servicing Agreement, Request by Mod Air Homes Limited. And the rec recommendation is that report DES 2020-41, entitled Westbrook at Grand Central Phase 5, Pre-servicing agreement request by Mod Air Homes Limited be received and that the necessary bylaw be presented to Council to authorize the Mayor and the Clerk to enter into the pre-servicing agreement. Mover and a seconder for this uh, recommendation, Councillor Sandu, Councillor Orr, comments or questions? fairly common process that uh, we're following through. So that uh, this is in the uh, southwest corner of quadrant of the town. So new development wanting to start there. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, it is carried. Item. 12.5, Report of Development and Engineering Services, Recommendation Report, the Owner's Applicant, Geranium Feathery et al., Agent David Folletta, Care of Boosfield Incorporated, and the location is parts of Lot 1 and 2, Concession 6, Geographic Township of West Glombray, and part of Lot 24, Concession 6, Geographic Township of Tecumseh. File number D142006. So the recommendation is that report DES 2020-42 be received, that all written submissions received in regards to the application and all oral submissions made at the public meeting held on June the 9th, 2020, relating to the application have been taken into consideration as part of the deliberations and final decision. That pursuant to sections 3417 of the Planning Act, no further public notification is required and that Zoning Bylaw Amendment D142006 for lands in the south half of Community of Bond Head, legally described as parts Lot 1, one and 2, Concession 6, Geographic Township of West Gloombury, and Part Lot 24, Geographic Township of Tecumseh, be approved as outlined in Report DES 2020-42, and the necessary bylaw be enacted to give effect to the rezoning. Mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Dyke, Deputy Mayor LaDuke, comments or questions?
Deputy Mayor Leduc. Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, I don't. I don't really see any uh, issue with uh, with these uh, requests for the uh, reduction in zoning. Um, I, I see the. We had some comments about height. Um, in my mind, the height is what the the developers the one the builder is the one that knows what the requirements of the uh, the general public want. Um, so I see the height as a it's a it's a greenfield. It's uh, quite a ways back from the actual existing uh, homes in Bond Head. So I don't see an issue with that. I'm. I'm in full support of the report right now. It's uh, the 1.8 side yard is uh, is basically for wraparound decks. You know, I mean, it's what it's what people want now. They they want some space. They want some nice living area, and they like the high ceiling. So, uh, I mean, we've done it throughout our community in other areas. Uh, Green uh, Green Valley, we did the uh, height requirements there at 13 meters, I think it is. And so it's not it's not out of the ordinary. It's what the uh, the people want now. They want the bigger, higher uh, ceilings and the bigger spaces. So living quarters. So I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think uh, we are doing a uh, review of our uh, our standards, our bylaw or for our zoning. So um, it's something that I'm sure we'll be looking at and we'll actually be changing in the future to to meet some of these requirements. So I think they're just a little bit ahead of where we are. We uh, we have a design standard coming up that we talked about uh, at our budgets. So uh, we know we're reviewing it. We're going to review this stuff and, and uh, make some changes that, that meet the requirements of what people want these days. So I think this is just, uh, I, you know, we listen to the residents. I heard the residents' concerns. It's, it's just uh, what I think the, the new buyers want. They want, uh, they want to have those uh, beautiful spaces. They, they removed the request for the second unit dwellings. I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, they, I probably uh, was probably on side with that. If, they, if there was an opportunity for it, I would have probably been on side with that because I think, you know what, we need to have all sorts of different opportunities for people to, uh, to buy and rent, things like that. And our community is really... Um, we know it's suffering in rentals. I mean, there's no offense or buts. We have a lot of people out there looking for rentals all the time that just can't find rental space in Bradford. So, um, but that's off the table. I, but I will support the uh, report of the our planning department for this, and I will support the way it's uh, written. I'm 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 good with those those zoning uh, uh, amendments. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I'm I'm. Um... Just, just a couple of questions, and these are coming from residents, of course. Uh, how, do can I get a uh, um, a number from staff or the planner as to the um, the setback, uh, the 1.8 minimum setback change? How many units that applies to in that uh, the the new subdivision would apply to? Okay, so we have Ray Kelso, our senior planner um, that was on this file. I don't know whether we also have Peter Lukes, our yep. director uh, here, but uh, Ray, do you want to? Uh, well, I'm uh, just looking it up. Um, the number of lots are the number of uh, ex exterior side yards. I believe it's uh, 53 or approximately 13% of the total number of lots. So that's a, that's a total number that would be able to do that then? Yeah, the, the total number. The, the, there's a bit of confusion between what an interior side yard is and an exterior side yard. And even today, there was a correspondence that came in still not understanding the difference between interior side yard and exterior side yard. Exterior side yard is the distance between the wall of a house and the street line street right of way. It's only on corner lots. It doesn't reduce the uh, distance between homes. And I think that's where a lot of misconception is, is that there's an idea that there's a, a reduction in the space between homes, which is not the case. The interior side yards, there's no uh, exception for those. Well, thank, thank you for that. that. I think that's a big concern for uh... That was one of the big concerns. Thanks, Ray. Okay, Councillor Lamb. Yes, to get on to what uh, Councillor Orrick just talked about, uh, technically these people own the property and they can't use it. And it, it, has happened, it happens all over the town now and existing. 
But down in uh, Ward 3, south of the 6th line in the Baby Wellington, they did that, and that allowed people to do wraparound porches. And it's no issue, or at least for them, because then they get to enjoy a little bit more of their property. And even some existing properties, like in the, in the subdivisions that were built in 79 and 8, or sorry, uh, 89 and down in, in Regency and all those streets in there, the side yards, you'll see that, that border on Melbourne, if somebody could have taken advantage of that, they could have had wraparound porches as well. And it is their property. They bought the property, but they can't make use of it. It's even difficult putting a fence out and, and side yard stairs. So um, in this particular subdivision, we went over that. We went over buffer zones, uh, the difference between um, nine foot uh, ceilings and eight foot ceilings. And there's buffers and there's buffers. And I also saw uh, some objections to walkout basements. I don't understand why that's an issue because some people want walkout basements and, uh, and you know, it allows them to have a, you know, level street parking, but then get to enjoy their backyard on a different level. And, and that allows for progressive uh, building uh, down, a, down a slope. So uh, I, this one here, also, uh, most of the entrances into this new subdivision are not in the downtown. And we had talked about that because in Thornton, for instance, and in Cookstown, they put new roads at the bottom end in order to get them in without forcing people to go into the downtown on a general park. The general, I'm, and I'm talking about where 27 runs on all three of the little villages. So um, it's been a long process. We've had a number of uh, of, uh, of concerns and uh, I know a lot of those people and I love those people. Hopefully they'll still like me tonight after tonight. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the developer and we also have to look at the provincial policy and, and, and all those things that uh, we're guided by the, uh, the, the uh, county policy that they have created a pretty good fit in here. So I'm, uh, I don't have any issues with this one at this particular time. Any other comments, uh, Councillor Orr? Yes, I'd be amiss if I didn't uh, um, also uh, hope that we keep pushing really hard for the bypass. Uh, I've had a few residents uh, with a couple of, uh, of emails and, and messages the last couple of days that the bypass uh, they're hoping that we really keep the pressure on to get that in so that when this uh, part of the development at least uh, uh, puts more pressure on the uh, uh, bond head that uh, that we have uh, an outlet for uh, uh, that for that traffic and uh, so hopefully our uh, our town will will keep that pressure on Yes, that's right, Councillor Orr, that uh, we'll try and uh, push the county to uh, move it up on their schedule and uh, realize the amount of development charges and the amount of tax dollars that they're going to get because of this development in Bond Head and uh, that they should be, uh, yeah, moving us up in the process. So any other comments? I guess one thing that I would uh, hope that our, our staff as, as well as uh, the applicants uh, look into moving forward and it's more in the engineering and the next stage, but uh, not have the street right in the center line of the road allowance. And this is the Gary Bain or the Gary, Gary, Gary Lamb uh, and Gary Beans too, I, I can say that, but uh, to, to allow more parking, to be able to have a parking spot between the sidewalk and the uh, the road. And if we could work with this development to have one more parking spot for every every home that's in there, that that would be significant. And because it's one of the biggest irritants of new neighborhoods is uh, parking and parking availability. And if there is an easy fix for uh, to be able to allow more more parking in the new areas, I think that that uh, would go a long way to uh, to building a, a better community for Bond Head and for uh, 
making people happy, the new owners. The one thing we want for the new owners in uh, Bond Head is to have a pride of ownership, a pride of the community, feel like they're part of the community and uh, be happy moving, moving to this area. So if uh, our staff can keep that in mind as well as uh, the applicants that uh, that can be uh, looked into to be able to uh, be part of the, the uh, engineering moving forward. That would be great. So with that, not seeing any more comments or questions. So uh, we have a recommendation on the floor. So I'll call for the vote. All those in favor and those opposed. So it did carry. So that recommendation uh, carried. So moving on to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next staff report and it's 12.6. Report of Development and Engineering Services, Recommendation Report, Owner's Applicant, Bradford Capital Holdings Incorporated. The agent is Ryan Bertanen of KLM Planning Partners and the location is Inverness Drive and Line 6 being block four on registered plan 51M 1063, file number D141916. And the recommendation is that recommendation report DES 2020-38 be received, that all written submissions received in regards to the application and all oral submissions made at the public meeting held on December 17th, 2019, relating to the application have been taken into consideration as part of the deliberations and final decision that pursuant to section 3417 of the Planning Act, no further public notification is required that the site-specific zoning bylaw amendment D141916 application for lands located at the intersection of Inverness Drive and Line 6, legally described as Block 402 Registered Plan 51M 1063 be approved as recommended in report DES 2020 that cast council pass a bylaw to remove the holding provision at such time as a tree inventory and retention plan have been submitted to the satisfaction of the town. Mover and a seconder for this report, Councillor Contois, Deputy Mayor LeDuc. Comments or questions? Deputy Mayor? Yeah, just a comment, Your Worship. I, uh, reading over this, and I, I, was quite, I was quite excited about it. I thought the, these were nice looking, and I think they're unique to the area. I think they're gonna look really nice when, they, uh, when they're done. I know there's a, some minor concessions, but I really, I really like the look of these, and I think they're going to fit in there quite well. So, so just a comment. I just, I just really like the renderings of them, and I thought it was nice, nice homes. Yes, they do look impressive. That they, uh, they are odd shapes, uh, lots, I guess, and uh, but they're working with what they have, and uh, we are accommodating them with these uh, zoning amendments. Council Lamb? Yes, I remember we had that uh, uh, public meeting on this and the subject property uh, where it is, uh, is 402, cross the road at, I, I believe it's 403, and they're, they're talking about a number of uh, 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 seven uh, townhouses and such, but I still want to be assured by Baby Wellington in the future that they're going to continue to look at uh, 403 as uh, a commercial development because there are no stores within uh, more than a mile. Uh, no commercial uh, operations down in at the whole south of the town is not serviced by any commercial. So if you look at the uh, map, uh, it actually was block Hold on, I'm trying to, this is a pretty wide map on my other little computer here. Yeah, 403. So uh, I, I hope that that is maintained sacredly as commercial. And I would accept a mix uh, because it could be a couple of stories and, uh, and you could have some uh, uh, pretty cool rental properties or condos or something there, but we need we need to have a dry cleaner. We need to have a convenience store. We need some place where somebody can walk and get a quart of milk uh, because the way it is now for everywhere down in the south end 
of uh, Peter's ward and uh, and uh, Raj's ward and my ward, there are no there along the sixth line. There is no commercial. The nearest commercial is Holland Street, and it would be a crime. And and what's happening here is that Baby Wellington is building right up to the edge of this, and I just hope it isn't doesn't become like it's happened in the past. And I'm not going to say Baby Wellington would do it, but we've had others in this town that uh, will build. Everything is easy to sell up to the to the point of where you get to the difficult piece, and they'll sit on it for 20 years, or uh, or they'll constantly come in and try to get it changed. And it really doesn't benefit the town to have uh, you know uh, seven more townhouses on four or three, or 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 you know four, uh, four big houses. It doesn't really benefit us, but it would benefit us if the people that lived in that area. And I'm talking, like I said, all those other areas along the sixth line, uh, you have to have a car. And if you don't have a car or you only got one car in your family or your kids or or somebody uh, who uh, doesn't drive anymore, they need that. So I'm hoping that I know council will pass this tonight because I think it's a pretty good plan. And I agree with James. But I also look at the future, whereas I feel like I'm going to get pushed at and leaned on. Uh, ultimately, to get this finished, because it'll end up as a as an uncut field, and I'm hoping that Baby Wellington will will honor that commitment. Any other comments, comments or questions? That uh, seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. So, all those in favor of the recommendation. Opposed? So it is carried. Move on to 12.7, report of corporate services, procurement activities, 2020 second quarter. So the recommendation is that report COR 2020-13 entitled procurement activities 2020 second quarter be received for information. Mover and a seconder for this. Councilor Ferragini. Councillor Orr, comments or questions? This is an information report that comes forward to tell us of uh, any specific procurement uh, issues or uh, um, and uh, single source issues, but it's uh, software that uh, was acquired from the uh, current uh, software provider, I guess. And uh, it's uh, just to keep us aware as council of uh, the different procurement uh, issues that have come up. Seeing no comments or questions, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, it is carried. 12.8, Report of Corporate Services, Animal Services Contract Update. Recommendation that report COR 2020-14 be received for information and the council authorized staff to undertake changes to animal services as outlined in this report. Mover and a seconder for this report, Councillor Sandu, Councillor Contois. Comments or questions? Councillor Contois. Yeah, just a comment. Uh, I, this is a great report and, and Brent uh, found efficiencies and, and made uh, one of our services better for the residents. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much. And I, and I actually uh, even noticed uh, the wildlife uh, rehabilitation contract. I thought that was interesting. I thought that was a, a great plus uh, added as well. Uh, I think it's a good contract, Brent, and uh, uh, very well done. Councillor Sandu. Yeah, I just want to echo the comments of uh, Councillor Contra. This is this is a very good report, very good outcome. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, this is whatever dollars are doing to help our residents. I'm glad that that word, your department is ahead of the game and looking at this. Thank you. 
I wonder whether somebody, Rebecca, or I don't know if Brent is on the line, but you could talk about the wildlife services that uh, uh, we do get uh, different calls and uh, whether this, this probably won't uh, answer all the calls that we get, but it will help some of our residents with uh, certain uh, wildlife that uh, is in distress. So uh, Brent, I see you're uh, on the line. So do you want to uh, comment on it? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And, and thank you to members of council for your support. On the, uh, the wildlife contract, um, we're proposing to enter into a formal agreement with Shades of Hope. They're out of PEFRA law, and we've been using them for some time to uh, rehab um, various wildlife that are injured or sick across the community. If you ever get a chance to get out to this facility, it's quite remarkable what, um, what they've built there and what their volunteers do on a daily basis to care for animals. Um, over the past little while, um, Bradford has seen an increasing amount of wildlife using this facility, whether it's urban sprawl or just a, a busier community. Um, some of our wildlife are affected by that. And, um, and we can um, bring various wildlife to this facility where they will provide medical attention, um, place to live, and some pretty remarkable facilities for, for the animals there. Uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, we take about uh, 50 animals there. And what we're trying to do is help support uh, the founders there and some of their volunteers um, to pay for some of the costs of those services, um, cost of medication, et cetera. So while it's a, a small cost um, in the overall scheme of things, I think it's an important service that we provide here and one that both our officers and the public at wide use on a, on a daily basis. So thanks again for your support there. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Councillor Farragini. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, similar comments to those that have been made already this evening. Um, interestingly enough, about a month ago, I came home and we had two ducklings in our garage. I don't know how they got there, but we had these two little ducklings and uh, I contacted Brent about it. And it was after hours, uh, it wasn't an emergency. So he asked me to take care of the ducklings till the following morning, at which point I grew very attached to them, but they had to come and take them away. So I'm guessing that those ducklings went to the Shades of Hope. I'm not 100% sure. Um, in regards to obviously this is a lot more um, having more boots on the ground, having having uh, our staff take care of this as opposed to just the random calls with someone else. If our staff is now taking care of this, is it is there any requirement for some extra training when it comes to the wildlife? Is there any cost? I don't I didn't see any breakdown for cost for that just per calls. Um, are there any additional training that our staff would have to go through when we're dealing with wildlife and, and what does wildlife consist of? Do they deal with, um, I don't know, potentially dangerous wildlife? Uh, Brent, I don't know if you can hit those up. Brent? Uh, thank you, Councillor Farragini, and through your worship um, to your question. Um, the, the type of wildlife that, that we incur is, is you typically see around the community from birds to turtles. We, we pulled a, a fawn off uh, the Highway 400 a few months ago. Um, just your, your typical, regular, everyday wildlife. Um, we do across, come across incidents where we deal with exotic or dangerous animals from time to time. We largely leave that up to the experts um, and put the onus on the, the individual owner to, to, to have the proper handling and such. In terms of our staff training, um, most of the responsibility for, for wildlife calls will fall to our existing animal services officer. Um, we also have another um, member of staff who, who just came on with the town of Bradford who has animal control experience. So that uh, is, again, a great asset to our team. And in terms of um, the emergency on-call rotation, we will be asking existing staff to, to play a part with that. So we do expect um, a little bit of um, dog handling training for staff that aren't typically exposed to that. Um, but that's something that we can currently cover under um, our existing and uh, amended budget for 2020. And we don't expect any overages there. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Dyke. Yep, Brent, uh, a, a great job, good report. Uh, I, I just I just wondered, uh, uh, do you get many activities, uh, you know, since we border our neighbors to our north in the and and uh, our neighbors to the south King Township? Do, do we have any uh, overlapping? Uh, do we have any situations where where uh, there's any, any with their services and ours, 
services overlap and but i i just wanted to point out one more thing and and uh it's good that i was expecting more calls from residents on this issue and i only received one one email about back in february so uh, you know you are doing a good job when when uh, when we don't get emails from residents and things are running well that's that's a good sign but my question on innisville and and, and king township do we have any overlap there Thank you, Councillor Dykin, through your worship. Um, we'll have some overlap in terms of the animals cross borders, absolutely. So, I mean, we do have to do some some work with um, King Township, who uses Vaughn uh, Animal Services for their contract, as well as Innisfil. Um, all municipalities will have overlap in the services they provide. Um, Bradford was part of a bigger uh, contract and municipal group uh, several years ago. Um, but personally speaking, and I think we've seen that in the service that's provided to residents, there has been some benefits to kind of localize um, some of those some of those efforts, meaning it's town of BWG staff that are in tune with resident needs, local issues that are out there responding to, to these types of concerns. So we have seen some benefits in terms of continuity of information, building rapport with neighborhoods and such in, in having those services in house. And, uh, and I expect this is another step in that direction. Councilor Lamb? Just to add a little bit, uh, uh, animals don't uh, follow property lines or, or, or boundaries. And uh, if you look at uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources, deer wearing areas, for instance, or, uh, or ranges of turkeys, uh, wild turkeys, uh, you can hear the coyotes out in the valley over here. So, um, and I have had calls in the marsh about people standing out pulling weeds and getting approached by a coyote. But we don't know where that one came from, King or uh, or Bradford, West Colenbury. But uh, you know what? When human beings invade uh, natural ranges, you're going to have uh, mixed up. And I think our staff is going to, or is doing a pretty good job. So I haven't had many calls, as Peter says, not not many calls lately. And if you really want to know about wildlife, TV is full of it. I I turned into a house cat, and I've watched Hope for Wildlife every day, and I know everything you want to know about. Adopting little baby ducks, Peter. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. And uh, any other comments or questions? But uh, it's good to see that, uh, and we're using a town of Bradford, West Gomber facility for for our uh, uh, animal control. So that's good. So with that, I'll call for the vote. So all those in favor. Opposed, it is carried. So the next report, 12.9, Report of Corporate Services, Bill 197, Consideration for Future Council Meeting Format. That report, COR 2020-15, entitled Bill 197, Considerations for Future Council Meeting Format, be received and that staff be directed to prepare the necessary amendments to the town's procedure bylaw in order to allow for their participation by electronic means of members of council, local boards and committees of either of them, regardless of declaration of emergency, and that the staff report back on the costs that are necessary to outfit the community center auditorium for in-person council meetings and that meetings of advisory committees resume in September. So a mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Contois, Councillor Lamb, comments or questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Duke. Yes, thank you, Worship. And uh, I fully understand this, this uh, report. It's a great report. And uh, I'm, I'm going to propose that we, we, we option with option one on this. Um, at this time, I'm not. I'm not sure. I want to do proxy voting until after I read the report. I think I agree with staff on that. I do look forward to seeing the cost to uh, incorporate um, a hybrid system where we can do the uh, in person, potentially the uh, the um, video, the electronic participation also. So, uh, I think it's a good format. I really do. I agree, uh, Rebecca and Jeff. You've done a great job of bringing these meetings to us, Chris, too, in the background. So, uh, um, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting doing Zoom. I I. I some of the residents are not completely thrilled with Zoom, um, but I think uh, I, I think it does open us up to more people being involved and in watching uh, our meetings. 
Um, it, it's there for them to watch at their leisure or even after on YouTube. So um, at this point in time, I think it's, it, it is probably the safest thing to do to, uh, to, do the, to continue on Zoom and do the option one. But I do, I look forward to seeing what the cost would be to move to that hybrid system in the future uh, if, if, that, uh, if that's something we can do in the future. So anyways, I would support option one in this uh, report. Thank you. Sorry. Other comments? Councillor Sandy. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm going to support this uh, report. Um, I have gotten emails. I have uh, spoken with residents uh, during my walks that, that they mentioned that otherwise they were never able to attend a council meeting. Um, with this option, they, they've been able to do it. I even had a chat with one gentleman said, that he works on afternoon shift at his work. And with this option, during his break, he's able to log on for five, 10, 15 minutes and, and just watch it for a few minutes. So uh, I'm happy that, you know, I'm, we're providing this option given that it's because of a pandemic, but, but uh, I, I support this report. Councillor R. No, I think it, for the circumstances, this uh, this has worked well with these meetings, and uh, I like the fact that more people can participate and off hours and everything. But we do have a, uh, a certain uh, group of people that uh, like the fact if there's an issue uh, that they want to uh, be involved in, that they're missing out on our. Uh, face-to-face -face meetings. So um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, support the electronic meetings at this point, but I definitely want to uh, see that we look into the costs of uh, probably the community center would be the best bet to get the most space. And I think we need to uh, work towards what it's gonna cost to, for this to, uh, to happen in the fall, if at all possible. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor. Now, I guess there is uh, one little section of this. Uh, the, the last the meetings of advisory committees resume in September. Would it be possible to change that to resume by September? Uh, we have had uh, economic development uh, committees uh, in July, and there's going to be another one in August. And we're still wondering about the Heritage Committee, whether uh, we need to have a, a Heritage Committee in the latter part of August, but uh, um, that uh, I'm not sure, Councillor Orr, you're the chair of the Heritage Committee. Have we, uh, is September soon enough for a Heritage Committee meeting or are there some issues that are, are coming up with Heritage? Uh, there, there is some uh, things that have come to the forefront that definitely uh, probably uh, as soon as possible would be uh, good to have a heritage meeting. This resolution does not preclude those early meetings. As you said, uh, your worship, we've already had EDAC meetings and committee of adjustment. So if we need to schedule one in September, we can, um, we would not limit that by this resolution. Okay, that's, uh, that's fine then that we can, uh, be nimble enough to, if we need to have a committee meeting that we can. So other comments, I saw their hands up. Councilor Contour. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree with uh, uh, Councilor Ard and, and James. Uh, you know, the electronic allowed people to, to actually watch us that never showed up to a, a council meeting before. So that's a positive. Uh, the more people we get interested in, in what's going on in the community, the better. Um, and that way there's an understanding of what that, what, you know, the procedures are. Um, but I also believe we need to actually get back to a, a format sooner or later of, of normal, uh, activities. So, uh, I agree with Ron, if we can, you know, look in the distance and, and say, you know what, it's probably the right opportunity now and then implement, then so be it. But that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Councillor Dykey. I, I agree as well. I think uh, 
so sooner than later. You know, if we can get to arena, we space out space out the meetings, and uh, you know, we can still do it on still record this on on YouTube and you know tape it and then show it to the to all, all to the residents. But I, I think sooner that we get uh, we uh, get together and uh, and have the, have a live uh, live meetings uh, with all of us. I, th I think the better. We got to get back to normal in time. Because we have masks, you know, sterilizing. We got to get back to it. That's how I feel. Yeah. Okay. Good uh, good discussion. And uh, yeah, in September we will have a staff report then on uh, what it would take to uh, have the community center available for council meetings moving forward, if we so wish. So. With that, I'll call for the vote. So all those in favor of the recommendation? And it is carried. 12.10, Report of Corporate Services, Committee of Adjustment Procedure, Terms of Reference and Property Standards Appointments. So the recommendation is the report CE, COR 2020-12, entitled Committee of the Adjustment Procedures, Terms of Reference and Property Standards Appointments be received and that the Committee of Adjustment Procedure Bylaw be brought forward for enactment, and that the Committee of Adjustment Terms of Reference be adopted, and that the necessary bylaw amendments be made to assign the Property Standards Committee as the Appeals Committee. So a mover and a seconder for this. Councilor Ferragini, Councilor Contois, comments or questions? That uh, uh, Councillor Lamb, just a brief question. Uh, it was a complaint in my ward recently about uh, uh, weeds, like on somebody's lawn, or they're they're not cutting the grass, and there's Queen Anne's lace, and Queen Anne's lace can get quite a hardy. Uh, uh, stock on it and that, that while the grass has gone dormant this is still growing like the stuff like that go to the to the property standards committee if uh, if if, uh, they, if we don't give anybody any satisfaction because our bylaw isn't intended to force people to cut uh, a couple of weeds down just the, uh, the appeal would be for someone who's been issued a property standards order so it would be for um uh, a, a homeowner who's been issued a property standards order and they don't agree with it and wish to appeal. So it's not for the complainant who doesn't receive um, the response that they require. This is actually, this is a quite literally just a housekeeping amendment. We, the Committee of Adjustment as the local board's required under the Municipal Act to have proce um, a procedural bylaw or, or procedures and we've just been remiss and not actually had them. And so this is a bit of a housekeeping. And uh, it, it just seems more appropriate that our appeals committee hears um, uh, appeals uh, from the dog control bylaw. Sorry, that's escaping me one other one, but property standards appeals are also very uh, appropriate because they're essentially working with our enforcement division as opposed to working with planning staff uh, it's more appropriate that the appeals committee be the, the party for those appeals. Um, it, it just seems a natural uh, fit. So this is just a bit of a, a procedural change or administrative change for council. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was under the impression that it might be for somebody who didn't get any satisfaction from uh, from town staff, as opposed to somebody who gets a, a, an order to comply. Thank you. I really appreciate the answer. Any other comments or questions? I think uh, it's good to uh, the appeals committee. We've got some good people on that. And I sometimes wonder if they are uh, very busy. <laughs> so this will give them more, uh, more um, meetings, I guess, but uh, they have an interest in what's going on in the town. And I think that they would, uh, they will appreciate this uh, extra assignment that they will have so that, uh, with that, seeing no, that no other comments, I'll call for the vote. So all those in favor? And it is carried. 1211, report of office of the CAO. So the alternate 
project funding streamlining the development process review. So the recommendation is the report CAO 2020-07 entitled alternate project funding streamlining the development process review be received and the council endorse the funding sources as detailed herein. So mover and a seconder for this. Deputy Mayor Ledoux, Councillor Orr, comments or questions? Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find, uh, so Jeff, uh, to you, if you don't mind, the cost of doing this is, uh, we had estimated 65,000 or is there more cost to it? Like, I'm, I'm in favor of moving this forward. I want, I certainly want to do this, but I just, I'm trying to find it in the, the uh, the uh, the report, and I'm, I apologize for not finding it soon enough. But is there a higher cost, sixty five thousand? I'll ask our CAO to comment. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, no, the, the the cost has not changed, or the the budgeted amount has not changed. Uh, what has changed is uh, essentially giving up on um, expecting a, a response from the province, the provincial grant program that we had originally applied for for this program. Um, that's, um, there's been no response there. So in order to move forward, I'm recommending that we finance through a different source or fund it through a different source as set out the report, uh, the lion's share of which is funded through development charges. Okay, thank you. I just, I was confused there and I apologize. Uh, and now I recall the reading of it. So <clears throat> yeah, anyways, I, I look forward to this. I look forward to this review going and I hope we, uh, we support this because it's something we need to do and we need to actually, uh, if, there's, if we can improve our, our system at any time, we want to do that. So. Um, I hope we can uh, look at this and we fund it through our, our capital reserve, I think it is, or anyways, I'll leave it at that. I do support the report, sorry. Other comments? No, I think we should move forward with this uh, review as soon as possible. I see Councillor Ferragini. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm just trying to remember when this first was brought forward to council and we, and we decided to move ahead with this initiative, uh, was it because the county was going to actually fund 90% of it? Is that mainly why we did it? Or was this something that we originally wanted to do? And the money that has to come out, the extra 90% that we require now, which is coming out of our strategic initiatives reserve, is that generally the main purpose of this reserve to fund um reports like this so the project itself was identified by council in your um uh, strategic priorities document it's it's one of the uh the um projects listed within that that uh, work plan you adopted um early in, in your first term or early sorry in this term so that's that's where the impetus is for the project itself um, it was proposed as an item in the 2020 budget. Um, at that time, a, a grant was available from the provincial government, not the county, the provincial government under um, um, uh, for streamlining and, and uh, embracing technological uh, improvements. Um, so we applied for that uh, and at the time had um, a high expectation that uh, we'd be successful, but um, you know, not, not surprisingly, uh, a number of provincial and federal grant programs have, have been paused while both levels of government are, are wrestling with the impacts of, of the pandemic. Uh, so given that this was one of council's priorities, that's the reason I'm, I'm bringing uh, it back to you to see if you still wanted to move forward in the near term. If so, we needed to identify different funding sources. Um, and as said in the, in the report, in um, um, recontemplating uh, how to fund this, um, our director of finance was comfortable in, in recommending that it satisfied um, eligibility as a, a growth related project, which is a, um, can be funded through our development charges. So that's where 90% of the funding will come from. The other 10% uh, will be funded to the strategic initiatives reserve that council set up to, to cover a number of different projects really at, at your complete discretion as to what will qualify for, qualify for that. Um, and again, given the linkage to your know, strap plan, we felt it be reasonable to draw funds from, from that the 10% that was required. 
Thank you for that, Jeff. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll be supporting this because I remember, especially when we were going through our initiatives, our priorities, streamlining and the words red tape, red tape kept coming up. So I know that we want to look at ways to become more efficient so that we don't have hiccups and, and individuals who are trying to get something done where it's an extremely slow process. So it'll be good to, to go through this exercise. Yes, and I think it will save the development community money. Time is money and uh, some of the processes that we have heard about, uh, there are hiccups that uh, unfortunately uh, can delay getting the, the proper uh, planning uh, procedures in place and uh, people can lose six months or whatever. And if we can streamline it and be able to work in tandem with uh, different departments and get departments uh, flowing material back and forth and helping each other out. I'm sure that we can speed up uh, the process. And as you say, red tape, uh, hopefully that uh, developers will see less, uh, less red tape uh, that they have to go through. So that, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, another way to fund it, but uh, I think let's get started with this study as soon as possible. And uh, there'll be some interviews with, uh, applicants and uh, staff to be able to figure out how to best proceed and uh, best best practices that we see from some other municipalities as well we can uh, entertain and uh, and move forward with so with that seeing no other questions or comments i'll call for the vote so all those in favor it is carried Your Worship. Yes, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, Your Worship. If you don't mind, I'm going to step out of the meeting now because my I can't take it with my eye anymore. It's just I'm in. Uh, it's too painful now. So, if you don't mind, I stay to the end. I had to stay to the end for that, but I uh, I just I have to leave. It's too it's uh, too hard on my eye now. It's killing me. I got too much of a headache now. That's so, fine, Deputy Mayor. That. And uh, yes, we appreciate. Uh, uh, yeah. It's just over a week ago you did have eye surgery, so that. Uh, yeah. Uh, take care of yourself and uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I gotta go. Yeah, that's fine. So, next up is item 13, and it's the request for staff reports. So, do we have any requests for a staff report at this time? Seeing none, um, no new business. So we'll move on to bylaws and uh, that, uh, so I'll read them out. Bylaw 2020-59, a bylaw to appoint a bylaw enforcement officer, Brian McDonald. Bylaw 2020-60, a bylaw to appoint a bylaw enforcement officer, Lauren Fortune. Bylaw 2020-61, a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2010-050 to rezone those lands and draft plan of subdivision S-1003 located in parts of lots one and two and 24, concession six. And bylaw 2020-62, a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2010-050 as amended to rezone block 402 on plan 51M 1063. Uh, Councilor Orr, do you have a... Yes, could I, uh, can I just pull 15.3 uh, and have a separate vote on those, please? All right, that's fine. So the recommendation will be that bylaws 2020-59, 2020-60, and 2020-62 be enacted. So those are the other three bylaws that we have in front of us. So a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Dyke, Councillor Lamb, any comments? Just congratulations to our new bylaw enforcement officers. So I'll call for the vote, all in favor? It is carried. So another recommendation that bylaw 2020-61 be enacted. So a mover and a seconder for this. Um, can I have a, this is the bond head one. So Councillor Sandu, 
And Councillor Contois. Any uh, further comments? So all those in favor of this bylaw? And those opposed? So it is carried. So at this time, uh, announcements and uh, Carrot Fest is coming up and it's certainly gonna be different, but there is gonna be a virtual component to Carrot Fest this year. And we'll just get Ed up on the screen. There is uh, Carrot Fest apparel, t-shirts that uh, people can purchase. And uh, I think that I read someplace that uh, the Holland Marsh Growers Association will be handing out free bags of locally grown carrots and collecting donations to the Helping Hand Food Bank. So that's on Saturday morning from nine to 12 o'clock. So it appears like that's uh, been set up, so that's good. And uh, so you can see the other online vendors market to promote uh, vendors that are usually there at Carrot Fest. So the other thing in the announcements that we wanted to announce is the Gary Baines Memorial Sports Fund. And that uh, with the passing of Gary Baines, his family was interested in uh, having something to help the community of Bradford West Gloombray. So this is like the Jumpstart program and uh, Online, you can go to the website that's there, canadiantirejumpstart.ca, Care Gary Baines Memorial, and pledge a donation. And it'll be for uh, individuals that uh, want to join sports that uh, maybe don't have the financial uh, wherewithal to, uh, to have the registration fees. And uh, this program will be for local kids to be able to, to play sports. So. We thought it'd be uh, fitting in memory of Gary to have this uh, sports fund and uh, the town is helping to, uh, to promote this and to, uh, to oversee it as well. So it is uh, something that the town uh, will be helping with. So. So keep that in mind. Um, County Council update. I guess uh, a bus route from Alliston to Bradford is now up and running. That uh, uh, some of you will have seen the buses already. On Friday, they made a dry run, and today they was, were supposed to start. And it comes from Alliston to Beaton to Bondhead, and then three stops in Holland Street at uh, in front of Walmart, in front of Toronto Street, and then at the Golden Train Station. So that uh, it'll have to be promoted, but hopefully that uh, people will make use of it. And I think it'll be the shorter trips, people from Beaton wanting to come to Bradford or people from Bondhead wanting to come from, to Bradford or to Alliston or to Beaton that uh, to visit people or to uh, workplaces or the big draw will be the GO train station, I think. But uh, so it's uh, visibility in our town of uh, a county county bus that will be uh, joining New Tecumseh and Bradford West Gilbert. So are there any other announcements at this time? Okay, seeing none, moving on, are there any notices of motion? So confirm proceedings, recommendation that bylaw 2020-63, a bylaw to confirm proceedings of the council meeting dated August the 4th, 2020 be enacted. So a mover and a seconder for this, Councillor Contois, Councillor Lamb, all in favor, it is carried. 
an adjournment recommendation that the meeting is hereby adjourned at 8.50 p.m. A mover and a seconder for this, Councillor Dyke, Councillor Orr, all in favor? It is carried. Thank you, everybody.